okay. All right. Well, tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will be sharing my screen with you in a couple of seconds. But I want to say that uh, the things that the Holy Ghost has been giving to us is very special. Uh, as I am sharing the word of God uh, and what I have received from the Lord, we're getting more and more requests for that conversation as it relates to the order of Melchizedek. And if you have sat under just a little that we've given, you will know that um, it is very significant information that impacts us for now. And as I'm continuing to open up and study all of my materials and commentaries and authors, and more importantly, the Holy Ghost, uh, when people are talking now about the Lord, it, uh, it's, it's, it's sounding off of what I know about the Holy Spirit. And wherever they are, I can probably make a comment about the order of Melchizedek or the priesthood or something there, no matter where they are. I was just on a Zoom just a couple of seconds, and the, the message from uh, Apostle Michael Fram, Fram was Jesus, the, bread, the word becoming bread. You know, so so I was like, <laughs> come on, man, you know, and uh, I was ready to, if I could have stayed on, I would have talked about bread and wine uh, and so forth. So, but it was, it was powerful. Uh, I thank the Lord for what he's saying. And I want to talk to you tonight a little bit more about uh, the priesthood, still pushing in that area, some significant things to say. I'm going to be using the Bible knowledge commentary, which made my job very easy. And for you to even be able to see, to see how you can do, uh, you know, um, some, some snapshots and uh, using these different programs to do screen shows and all that other stuff, whatever they call them, uh, slide shows. Uh, and whatnot, and uh, you can do this. So this is very simple, it's very clear, but with my commentary, my heart, my perspective, this ought to help you. Tonight, we're dealing with, and I want you to take notes, but thank God for this recording. You can always go back to it. There's no way but our time that I'm going to exhaust everything that I have to say, but there's some significant things that uh, need to be said. I'm dealing with Hebrews chapter nine, and I am also using the Passion Translation, which has been good for me. Uh, it's not my go-to, uh, but it makes it so easy for the young in Christ, um, even the advanced in Christ, to see an amplification, uh, uh, a translation of uh, what the scriptures really, really mean uh, concerning some of these things. So chapter nine is fascinating. Uh, chapter 10, chapter one, two, three to 13 are incredible. All chapters possess language of uh, this priesthood in this new covenant and the king priest of this covenant, most importantly, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to know, ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, this would be mundane if you're not hungry. And you couldn't keep up if you're not hungry. So I pray in Jesus' name that your appetite is up so that you can get what we're saying, because I'm telling you, this is a cornerstone teaching. This is a foundational teaching that you could measure everything by. So look at this tonight. I'm rejoicing in this teaching. So I'm going to share my screen here. Amen. And of course, it's not what I need to see. So let me just uh, get out of this for one second. One second. Give me one second. Amen. And let me pull up what I need to pull up right here. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. And then what I'm going to do is come back over here. Sorry about that, y'all. Let me share my screen now. Look at that. All right. 
Okay, all right, very good. So I'm dealing with uh, the eternal priesthood, the eternal indestructible life. Since our teaching about uh, dealing with the humanity and deity, that's where this was stirred up from. Okay, so you see me dealing with eternal priesthood now because that's Christ. And the eternal indestructible life could only come from the Christ. And so uh, again, if you're doing some studies, look at those scriptures, Eric and I were talking today where it says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus or Christ alone is dealing with the Christ side of the ministry. But then there'll be other passages where it's Christ alone, Jesus alone, I'm sorry, Jesus alone, which is absolutely dealing with the humanity of Jesus. But when you have Christ Jesus and Jesus Christ, you see a mixture there where both of them are incorporated or the emphasis is on the Christ. So uh, here we are. Uh, again, I'm going to be using the Bible knowledge commentary and some of this stuff. And uh, let's look at this using the Passion Translation. Read with me, saints. Let this bless you. And again, please remember, you could always, Willie Baxter, I see that you're using your camera. That's wonderful. But guess what? You could go to YouTube and see this whole thing and stop it and pause it and copy it and do all that you want to right there. So that might save you all some time. But if you like using the camera, that's fine. Wonderful. I'm just telling you, YouTube's got it. This exact presentation. Uh, Hebrews 9, 1 to 5. It says now, and look at the emphasis and the highlights and the underlines. All of it is me screaming at you to pay attention to whatever, wherever I've uh, made a highlight or uh, any kind of underlining or bold texting. It says, now the first covenant, important to look at, there were specific rules for what? Worship. I find that interesting. For worship, including a sanctuary on earth to worship in. Y'all know what that's talking about. Uh, when you entered the tabernacle, you would first come into the holy chamber where you would find the lampstand, and the bread of his presence on the fellowship table. Uh, then as you pass through the next curtain, you would enter the innermost chamber called the holiest sanctuary of all. Uh, it contained the golden altar of incense and the Ark of Covenant Mercy, uh, which was a wooden box covered entirely with gold uh, and placed inside the Ark of the Covenant Mercy uh, as the golden jar with mystery manna inside, Aaron's resurrection rod, which had sprouted and the stone tablets engraved with the covenant, the, the covenant laws. On top of the lid of the Ark uh, were two cherubim. Y'all see all the pictures that we showed you, right? Angels of splendor with outstretched wings overshadowing the throne of mercy. But now it is not the time to discuss further the significant details of these things, right? This is important. Now with commentary here, it says, with regard to the aging first covenant, the writer wished to discuss that covenant's regulations for worship and its earthly sanctuary. These he highlighted in order to contrast them with the superior features of the new covenant ministry. So again, that's, this is what these things are contrasting. And it says superior features, I love that. Now, how earthly or cosmicon or mundane that first sanctuary was, he emphasized by reviewing the material objects associated with it. All these had typological value, but the author could not discuss these things in detail at the time. He confined himself to the chief features of the comparison he wished to make, all right? The great apostle Paul. And so let's keep on moving. 
and look at this stuff carefully and look at what's highlighted because we've talked about all of this, but look at it, it's so vivid with the way that uh, the Passion Translation puts it and really, really expands on it. Verse six, it says, so with this prescribed pattern of worship, y'all see that? They were worshiping the whole time. It's describing everything that they did was a pattern of worship. The priest would routinely go in and out of the first chamber to perform their religious duties. Uh, and the high priest was permitted to enter into the holiest sanctuary of all only once a year. And he could never, y'all see that? He could never enter without first offering sacrificial blood for both his own sins and for the sins of the people. Now, the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen, uses the symbols of this pattern of worship. Look at this again, this pattern of worship to do what? To reveal that the perfect way of holiness had not yet been unveiled. They didn't get it yet. It was not unveiled. It was veiled. So for as long as the sanctuary stood. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, that's a key phrase right there for as long as the tabernacle stood. Listen to me, sons and daughters, as long as that, as that thing is up, the other could not come into effect. That's where you get my language from. You got to scrap it all. You have to scrap the, the, the tabernacle. And I have had uh, some leaders raise their eyebrow when I said that, including Levi is fired, all of it. The, the whole mess has got to go. You see, but that's why, you see, you, you have to, as long as the tabernacle stood, you cannot enter into the holiest in the new tabernacle, the true tabernacle that Jesus entered into. So it was an uh, illustration, right, that pointed to our present time of fulfillment demonstrating that offerings and animal sacrifices, come on, y'all, we don't do animal sacrifices anymore. Offerings and animal sacrifices had what? Failed to perfectly cleanse the conscience of the wisp of the worshiper, right? Because it had to be continuous. It never abolished how they felt guilty for their sins and really not connecting with God as that design of worship was supposed to do. So they were only just type and shadowing this stuff, but never accessing what they really needed. So for this old pattern of worship, do y'all see that? Was a matter of what? External rules and rituals concerning food and drink and ceremonial washings, which was uh, imposed upon us until the appointed time of heart restoration had arrived. Can I tell y'all something, ladies and gentlemen? That point in that time is when you get it. I mean, it happened when the Hebrew writer gave it to us. But until you get it yourself, you cannot, you still operate on a system that does not allow you to fellowship with God. Did y'all hear what I just said? You're tied, you, you are still tied into a system where you're trying. It's still religious. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? It's still religious. That's what's happening, ladies and gentlemen, in 2022. There are people that have not gotten the full manifestation of this understanding. So guess what they do? They, they don't have the actual sacrifice. They have none because it's obvious they don't have bulls and goats, but they, have, they don't have the king priest either. They don't have the actual, uh, the actual true worship that brings a, a contentment a closure to the old system, a closure to my sin consciousness. See, see, if you have truly gotten this, the past is truly the past. And it does not impact 
to you. You don't even have a conscience of it that even when you may mess up, ladies and gentlemen, that consciousness cannot attack you and make you feel like you failed God. All you do is you repent and you move on forward. But for those that are still under that old system and don't understand the finished work of the Christ and entered into the walk with him, then sin can so easily beset you. And every time you make a mistake and do something crazy in your own mind because of that consciousness, you feel like a failure, you feel like you're not worthy, and it hinders you moving forward in your calling, in your functioning, in you accessing the things of God that you need and want. You can't get those things if your conscience is still in an old system of punishment and reward. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're not in a system of punishment and reward. We're in a system of yes and amen because of a position that God had made for you. You are accepted in the beloved. So the promises of God, all of them to you are yes and amen. Are y'all with me on that? Are y'all with me? So my sin consciousness is detached from you're going to be punished now for what you just did. No, 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 no. You, you don't think that way anymore because you've been delivered from that is what this new covenant built on better promises. Isn't this a better promise? It's not punishment and reward, that's a promise. <laughs> it's not judgment, but it's mercy. That's a promise. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? So until you truly access that, number one, uh, another issue that you're gonna have is that uh, there's not enough goodness to lead you to a repented lifestyle. If the promises are not that great, then you still, you know, on the fence about things. But it makes me want to cancel every wicked appetite and thing that once beheld me and caused me to stumble because the covenant is so good and the promises are so great that I want only that and nothing else. That's why I went, when I found the treasure, come on, when I found the treasure, I went and sold everything, including everything that used to own me, run me, keep me in bondage, stuff that I liked. No, no, no. I found a great treasure or I found a great pearl or a pearl of great price. Therefore, I throw away everything. 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 That's why. So, an interpretation: the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, a repentant lifestyle, meaning a lifestyle of changing my mind towards the kingdom of God. Only. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? Wave at me if you hear me. Come on. If you got an appetite for the things of the kingdom, if you got an appetite for the things of the kingdom, you ought to wave and say, I got that and I'm going to walk in that in the name of, I exchange it for everything. Everything. So now I am not distracted with this fallen realm or nature. Not at all. I'm advancing forward with expectancy towards the goodness of God and it towards me. Does it help anybody right there? I'm telling you, that's got me free. I have such expectancy right now for God to do some amazing things in us. Come on, let's complete the sentence. In us for his glory. For his glory. Do you not know, I'm going to run when I say this, do you not know that it glorifies God that you are thankful for what he has done for you, for what he does for you, what he gives you, whether they are needs or wants. He rejoices that you're rejoicing, that you are happy. That glorifies him. That you could say, Lord, I, I, I don't take it for granted. Not everybody is walking like this. Not everybody has this revelation. So I rejoice that you've given it to me and I'm rejoicing in what you've given to me and it's increasing, it's increasing. 
That's why I have an appetite to keep on digging, ladies and gentlemen. I keep on digging for, for, for rhema, for revelation, so that I can get freer and freer. That, that, that just like my Christ, that at his word, things just move and obey him. Creation cooperates with sons that are walking in this revelation. Can somebody say amen? All right. So let me get back to my shared screen over here, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so so we see, amen, uh, uh, with the worship of this old pattern of worship was a matter of external. So what is the new then? It's internal. It's internal. Can anybody hear what I'm saying? All right, so let's see where we're at. All right, so uh, the regulations, April, smile, girl. Look at that. I put, I put my little picture up in there, girl. Watch it now. All right. So the regulations for worship mentioned in verse one now dealt with so that they could un that they that they could under that they underlined the insufficiency of the old covenant service. Whereas the outer room of the tabernacle could be entered regularly by the officiating priest, it was only on the Day of Atonement, y'all need to understand that, Leviticus 16, that the high priest entered the inner room uh, of the Holy of Holies. And then only with sacrificial blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, had committed in ignorance. This restricted access Listen, clearly demonstrated that the true entrance into God's presence, symbolized by the most holy place, had not, had not, had not yet been disclosed. That, that at least was the message the Holy Ghost intended to communicate by this arrangement. Again, that's the Bible knowledge commentary. Now, the Levitical arrangements were designed to convey the idea that the true way to God did not lie in them. Do you not know? This is suggesting that Levi knew he was just being a type in a shadow, right? That's what it's suggesting. Uh, that uh, what this indicates for the present time is that all, the old covenant sacrificial system did not meet human need at its deepest level. So uh, it could not clear the conscience of who? The worshiper. I got a question for you. Is your conscience clear now? If not, you are under the wrong priesthood. Can y'all see that? So listen, you, that's a, that's a, listen, that's a Selah moment. Stop right now. Because if you are still haunted by what you did in the past or what they did or whatever in the past and you, you don't sense a forgiveness of that and that your conscience is clean, clean, that God won't deal with you about that, you are under the wrong revelation. You're under the wrong priesthood and Christ has not died for you. <laughs> Hence, the regulations which formed part of the observant worshipers' adherence to this system were chiefly concerned, come on, with externals which were only meant to apply until the time of the new order. It's letting you know they, it would, that old system was powerless to clear the conscience. It was always temporal. You could walk out the tent and think something bad and that law required that you make another sacrifice. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? Some people could hold their consciences for maybe a week or two days and then realize, oh, I thought the wrong thing and I did the wrong thing again, back to the tabernacle with another sacrifice. Could you imagine the unrepentant sinner at all levels could go bankrupt trying to go uh, with his livestock because they had no control over sin. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? So the words of Hebrews 9 and 10 probably refer to sectarians 
uh, for whom food laws and ceremonial washings retained great importance. The readers must remember the transitory nature of these things under the aging covenant and should not return to them. Somebody say, I'm not returning to any of that. I am not, come on, say it with an attitude. I am not returning to any of that mess, not at all, in the name of Jesus. So uh, Hebrews uh, 9, 11, and 12, let me give you a piece of the puzzle and a key, all right? So it says, but now, but now, but now, the anointed one has become the king priest. Oh, I love it. Of every wonderful thing that has come. For he serves in a greater, more perfectly heavenly tabernacle, not made by men. Verse 12. And he has entered once, come on, once. And forever, you should circle that if you got it in your Bible, into the holiest sanctuary of all, not with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the sacred blood of his own sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen. This is, if y'all could follow me, the second part of the manifestation of the bread and wine Melchizedek gave to Abram. See, the blood part now, the wine part now, right? The sacred blood now of his own sacrifice, and he alone has made our salvation. Come on, anybody wrestling with once saved, always saved, or you could lose your salvation, which one of it is? Listen, you have left the place of the using the word eternal. He has alone made our salvation secure eternally or forever. That kills that argument dead, doesn't it? So the one that has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's yours forever. You ain't got no power, nor permission, nor royal uh, decree that you can make to undo what the king has granted. No matter how crazy you get, you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Can anybody say amen to that? My goodness. I think backslidden is just a religious word that people who can't explain uh, a person struggling, they use that in human terms because they can't explain kingdom and a king's decree. So, so then the Democratic Republican mindset says you can vote your way in or out. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that alone. When Christ entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, Christ's blood, and look at all the scripture references, rather than by animal blood, he likewise demonstrated the superiority of his service because his blood had obtained what? Eternal redemption. Eternal, that's what we're dealing with. Amen? Thus, the value of his sacrifice is immeasurably greater than the animal offerings of the Levitical arrangements. A perfect ransom price had been paid for human redemption. And because it need not be paid again, this sacrificial act was once for all. That redemption is an eternal one. Somebody in here, just listen, wave if you got that. Just come on, let me know. Do you listen? This is not up for conversation. The king has decreed this, and he did an act that forever redeemed us. Forever, forever. It's an eternal matter. Somebody write that in your notes. It's an eternal matter. This is critical for you to get. I'm almost done. Look at what it says in 9, 13, and 14. And you know, I've got a lot more to add to this, but I, I'm giving you this. Listen, under the old covenant, 
Y'all see my little animals? Yeah. Do y'all see them? Look at that. Uh, it says the blood of bulls. Look, I got a picture of a bull. And goats and the ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them what? Outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. All the Levitical stuff could do is deal with the outside stuff, right? Yet, how much more will the sacred blood, come on, Elder Willie, of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciences, Elder Lynn, for by the power of what? the eternal spirit. He has offered himself to God as a what? Perfect sacrifice that now, that now, that now frees us from our dead works, which is worship that doesn't get anywhere, to worship and serve the living God. That's what dead works means, ladies and gentlemen. Dead works is religious practices that does not get us into the presence of God. <laughs> you might want to write that in now. Dead works is, is religious practices that do not get us into the presence of God. Jesus alive. Look at that. Uh, so, so, in 9, 13, and 14, this eternal redemption through which the blessings of the new covenant have reached all believers should affect the way believers serve God. Is that, somebody should say amen to that. If you really got this thing, it should affect the way that you serve God. Old covenant rituals, which rituals served for the ceremonially unclean and only made them outwardly clean. But the blood of Christ can do much more. Hallelujah. His was a sacrifice of infinite value because through the eternal spirit, somebody say through the eternal spirit, he offered himself unblemished to God. With this lovely assertion, the writer of Hebrews involved all three persons of the Godhead in the sacrifice of Christ, which magnifies the greatness of his redemptive offering, unblemished, a Greek word, fittingly describes Christ's perfection, for it is also used of spotless animals brought for sacrifice. Isn't this wonderful stuff, ladies and gentlemen? Look at what it says. Such a great accomplishment ought to cleanse our consciences, uh, our consciences from what? Acts that lead to death. But the expression acts that leads to death is literally, there it is, dead works, which is, uh, in this context, seems to refer to the Levitical rituals that, in contrast, with the work of Christ can never impart spiritual life. Isn't that wonderful? You should write that down. You should snap that one with your camera. This is serious stuff right now. It says also in 6.1 of Hebrews, uh, where such acts that lead to death are referred to, the writer wished his readers would give up all thoughts of returning to old covenant rituals. Y'all know Hebrews 6 and 1 said, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the, the, the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on, right? Their consciences ought to be perfectly free from any need. Come on, I'm gonna read that again slow. Their consciences ought to be perfectly free from any need to engage in such things and retaining their confidence in the perfect efficacy of the cross. They should hold fast their profession and serve the living God with the new covenant 
arrangements. Isn't that beautifully written, ladies and gentlemen? This stuff had me hopping in my office and just rejoicing in how clear this is and what the impact of this new covenant led under a new priesthood brings to us. It shows us how the other was uh, a temporal and external, and this one is permanent, eternal, and it deals with the inside man so that you might be strengthened with might in the inner man, Paul prayed. Okay, so amen, almost done. Uh, Hebrews 9, 15, it says, Jesus is the one who has enacted a new covenant with a new relationship with God so that those who accept the invitation will receive what? The, oh, look at this one, eternal inheritance. Look at that. He has promised what? To his heirs. Are you an heir? There's an eternal inheritance. For he died to release us from the guilt of the violations committed under the first covenant. How clear is that? Finally, finally. The, these looks like the glasses Miss Leno wearing right now so we could really see, amen. 915, so to, to do so is to retain the hope of an eternal inheritance. Look, eternal redemption and the eternal spirit. Could y'all see those three? Write them down, please. Eternal inheritance, eternal redemption, eternal spirit, worthy of your study. Worthy of your study. All of them are eternal. It's the work of the Christ under the order of Melchizedek. Forever you have these things that have been purchased. It says, of which has been promised to recipients of new covenant life. Christ is the mediator of that covenant and the inheritance is available, come on, to those who are called since the death of the mediator has freed them from all guilt. I'm free from all guilt, somebody should say that, derived from the sins committed under the first covenant. This is extraordinary information, sons and daughters. Extraordinary, worthy of looking at, worthy of studying and putting together and attaining it for yourself. Now, when you get that life, you can give that life through revelation and through testimony. You can give that life. See, we need to get this clear so that people can wake up and understand that the high priest under the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the uh, apostle and high priest of our confession, Hebrews 3 and 1, has gained all of this for us and has, through that act, abolished everything that Moses and the priesthood of Aaron were afraid of, even the people of Israel, they were only under types and shadows that can never take away sin. And all that, listen, and when it says never take away sin, ladies and gentlemen, apply all the impact of sin, what it brings to us now, if you could catch this revelation, whatever it has produced, has been demolished at the cross. So whatever bondages, sicknesses, poverty, and anything that the king did not intend was sin, was nailed to the cross, it is no longer yours. If you could catch the revelation, if you could catch it, then all these things have got to let you go. They are dismissed by this revelation. So I want you to look at the stain of sin and know that it has been washed away. Everything that it has caused, washed away. 
just one last enemy called death that we have to deal with, but then there is still resurrection awaiting every one of us that believes. Isn't that some incredible stuff that God, that God, his word never returns void. It looked like it did when Adam fell, but God had a lamb, come on, that was slain before the foundations of the world, that when Adam did his foolishness, God had a word that was alive prophetically waiting to manifest, to reverse everything that, that Adam did. Everything. Everything. Can somebody catch that tonight that everything has got to roll back? If you're still breathing right now, whatever sin did, you start to pray and make a demand. Lord, that sin has been forgiven. It has been rolled back. So to my children, where I see the, the impact of the ignorance of my knowledge of sin is now renewed. And now in Jesus name, I'm praying for my children and making declarations over them. I'm making declarations over my body. I'm making declarations over my marriage, over my money, over my circumstances, back to the original intent of the Father. Can you, listen, you can only have this if it becomes a rhema for you. Right now, it might just be a word. Right now, I'm giving you logos, but somebody might wake up here. Somebody in here might embrace what I'm saying, and it will snap you into freedom. Deliverance, healing, prosperity is coming. God is going to bring everything back to his original intent. I got a question for you. Do you know the Lord when he made that statement? I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord. They are thoughts for good and not for evil to give you a hope and a fulfillment word, a word that does not return void, a future, a future. I said it and I'm looking over it to perform it. The question is, do you believe me? Do you believe me? So, 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 so sup at my table and eat all that you can. Eat your deliverance. Eat your healing. Eat your prosperity. Eat your family being one. Eat all the stuff that's at the table of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. It is yours. Will you come and sup with him? Will you come and dine at his table and partake and ingest it? Will you take the bread and eat on it? Will you drink the wine to wash it down and digest it in your spirit and now able to touch every part of your spirit man, impacting your soul, impacting body? Just one drink, just one drink. Somebody in here, repent. Change the way you're thinking. Add this to yourself, make a demand, stir yourself. See somebody right now, I'm telling you, you're hearing something, write down what you're hearing that's yours and go into a fast. I dare you. Go into a fast and start studying, meditating, declaring, believing. Turn it into a rhema. Turn it in your spirit. Turn it in your spirit. Turn it over. Keep swishing and tasting and seeing how good he is. And you will have manifestation. You'll have manifestation. Hallelujah.